Lord said to me, prayer unlocks the door to repentance and repentance unlocks the door to prayer. Now the way that works is when a heart cries out to God and knows he's, he's in trouble. He knows, she knows, they know that they're in trouble. Uh, when that heart begins to cry out in prayer, then the Lord begins to reveal what needs to take place in the area of repentance. Now, that's the first thing. Then repentance, when it happens the way it's supposed to happen, it will actually open the door to prayer like you've never seen before. And what the Lord has shown me and has shown me, that those who are struggling with their prayer life, there's something keeping them bound in the area of repentance. Uh, let me explain a little more in detail what we're talking about. You can go through life and those little things that doesn't seem to amount to too much, uh, we've gotten used to bad, bad mouthing people. We've gotten used to slandering tongues. We've got used to gossip and tail bearing. But what happens when the Spirit convicts and tries to show you that that is wrong and you cover it up? The Bible said, either cover it, his sins shall not prosper. Uh, so what will happen? It begins to harden your heart. Repentance keeps you from your heart becoming hardened. The, the way this thing is supposed to work, the, the instant you have failed in any area of your life, it's more than an apology. If you say, oh, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have done that, I'm sorry. Uh, that's not very sincere to start with. But when you realize that there's things in your life that are holding you back. It's in the area of repentance. If you can't pray and you're having trouble with your prayer life, you probably have something you haven't truly repented of. Let me show you how serious this is. All right? If I say something unlovely to a person, I, my love for you is supposed to be capable of rebuke and all kind of things. But even if that rebuke is not given in the right way, a critic is a dangerous guy. Because a critic is not interested in helping you, he's interested in destroying you. That's the whole purpose of a critic. You see, a person who wants to help you helps you with love, and you can tell the difference. But if you get to be critical towards another person, and instead of solution, you're adding to the problem. Now you've got a problem on your hand, and you're starting to feel a heaviness, and you don't know what it is, but you should know what it is. You violated the law of love. Now, joy is exactly the same way. You lost your joy. Go find out where you failed in the area of love and joy. It, somewhere or the other, you didn't take care of something that was going to steal your joy away from you. You didn't take care of it correctly. So now, when you begin to understand the principle, the way this works, there's a law that goes with love, and there's a law that goes with joy, and also peace. Now, in the area of peace, when you when you disturb somebody's peace, uh, your heart will become hardened. You begin to get hardened to this thing, so you really don't care anymore. And it drives you deeper and deeper. That's why the Bible says, harden not your hearts. The way you keep from hardening your heart is when you recognize you made a failure or made a mistake or said something you shouldn't have said, it looks oh so small. It's more than saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it. I reckon that wasn't very nice. It isn't that. It's a cutting it off. It, now, as I go along, I want you to bear those things in mind. Now, <clears throat> the Lord has given us the ability to pray to, uh, to repent. Uh, 
But there are some people who do not have the liberty to pray repentance. They don't have that liberty. And the reason they don't is because something's in the way. In Luke 18, 13, uh, the publican standing afar off after he heard this, may have heard this Pharisee pray, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What he did was he is praying that I'm a sinner, and he that that uh, that cry, that heart cry, begins to loose him, and it begins to bring him out. He's not going to say that a hundred times, or he better not. What he needs to do is recognize he's a sinner. That's why a sinner can get saved. He recognizes he's a sinner. He's hopeless. He's helpless without God. Now, uh, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, it says in Romans chapter 10 13. Uh, so, what the Lord is giving you an opportunity that even in inside of your heart that may not even be in the form of words, it's a heart cry to God for deliverance. And deliverance only comes through repentance. You'll not get re deliverance from anything until repentance takes place. Now, if you'll understand this, uh, we go down through here, you'll understand it better maybe. Uh, the prayer of this nature opens the door to repentance. However, confession must precede uh, 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 confession uh, must uh, conf uh, 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 repentance. Now, let me ask you something. How many people have you heard? It's always confessing this and confessing that and confessing this and confessing that. They're having a problem because they don't understand that they haven't repented somewhere along the way. They haven't got it cleaned up. So they keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. You can decide you're going to change. I'm going to change now. This is all there is to it. I'm going to change. This is it for this habit. I'm not going to do it anymore. And you're struggling with it for the next six weeks. You've never repented of it. <clears throat> when you begin to see your helplessness and your hopelessness and begin to cry out, maybe not in words, but in your heart is a heart cry that goes far beyond words. And it says, Lord, I can't break this thing. I can't break it. I just can't. But when that person is set free, that's it for that. It's over. But that repentance has to take place, and it's not apology. Well, I know that we all sin and come short of the glory of God, you know. Yeah, well, you might as well go home. Forget it. You're going to have to struggle the rest of your life. When you begin to make excuses for your failures and for your mistakes, and etc., you're going to have trouble the rest of your life. That's just the way it is. That's the way it's going to be. That's the, the, the way it, it works. And when John was baptizing in Jordan, people came confessing their sins. Uh, this opened the door to them receiving repentance because they confessed their sin. When you confess your sin, what you're doing is loosing yourself from that sin you're confessing. So when you confess your sins, that's where you receive deliverance. You find in Mark chapter 3, 6, it says uh, they were baptizing in Jordan, confessing their sins. And then it says in Mark 1, 5, and there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they in Jerusalem and were all baptized to him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. You see, folks, confessing your sins is more than saying, well, I'm only a sinner, save a grace. You know what? That stuff will stop once you understand repentance. You'll stop that. Uh, it may make a beautiful song, but you'll stop that thing about once I was a sinner, I'm a sinner, save a grace. Once you're free, you won't be feeling that sinner stuff no more. The Pharisees didn't understand repentance, and most people in our day, 
uh, do not uh, associate repentance with baptism either. What the Pharisees came down, they want to get baptized. Everybody else get baptized. The response was when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to free from the wrath to come? Right here, the next verse is the secret to this whole thing. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. That's the whole secret. You, when you're repenting, you have fruit. It's a fruit of repentance. You see a godliness, a, a sorrow for sin. And he called him a, a viper. Now that wouldn't work in our day. The way you would say it, they bring, say, well, Jesus understands. And after all, we all have to grow up sometime. And just come on in, old brother Pharisee, and get your baptism inside you. See, come on in. There is no, no teaching repentance. A repentance means that I forever cut off that thing. It's gone. No intentions of ever yielding to that thing again. It's over. It's past tense. It's gone. Because I have sought the Lord and I prayed and I've sought His face and I pled with the Lord for deliverance from this thing and I made a direct turn around. A lot of times that's going to take tears. It's going to take agony. And it may not be an easy thing. I, I'm going to try to explain to you tonight that repentance is often a hard thing. It is not something that just happens at a wink of an eye. It is something that has to take place. So you're, when you get to the place where you see that sin as exceeding sinful, for godly sorrow worketh repentance and salvation, not to be repented of. It says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. I want to show you something. If you don't see that thing as exceeding sinful, you don't see that thing as separating me from God. What will happen if I say to you, well, I shouldn't have said that. That wasn't very nice. I, you know, uh, I shouldn't have said that. What will happen without doubt? Your heart will become hardened. It begins little by little to harden. As it begins to callous and harden, now it's not a big difficult thing for you now to talk about people and badmouth them and so on like this, because it's it's pretty simple. I've said this numerous times in television, radio, and everywhere else, that when I used to be a cusser, a real cusser, uh, but you know the first time I cussed, I felt terrible. But I justified it because other people of my peers was doing it. And you know what? It wasn't very long cussing became a part of my life. It wasn't. There was nothing stopping me now. I became hardened to it. And thank God for mercy. Because one day way down the road, when I began to seek the face of God, he said, that cussing has to go. That's why prayer unlocks the door to repentance. And repentance unlocks the door to prayer. And when, you, when you get to the place where you realize that that sin has separated me from my God, it has hurt me. It's hurt Him. Uh, sin leaves injury. It leaves a wound. And it, it hurts. It, it's there. It, it, and what happens if it's not taken care of properly? You say, well, I don't know if I'm forgiven or not. Then some preacher will gladly tell you, oh, yes, God is faithful and just forgive us our sin and cleanse us all unrighteousness. So you're okay. But when you really get into understanding repentance, you may not be okay. If, you, if you're not freed from that thing, it's not okay. Repentance is a freeing agent. It looses you. That's the purpose of repentance, is to loose you from what you did. But if you are going to be placing damnation on other people and criticizing and finding fault with them, you're, you're hardening your heart. 
I believe that if you was to find the critics that uh, criticize all the preachers around, they may be tr true what they said. They may have a bad feeling towards this situation, but their hearts is probably hardened that they don't mind talking against anybody. See, the first time you speak of, against a child of God, you're going to feel bad about it. <clears throat> But if you don't do anything about it, it won't be so bad after a while. And little by little, you get harder and harder and harder. So now it's not uh, it's not unusual for you to be gossiping and slandering and tailbearing. If you are a slandering tongue, or if you have a gossiping tongue, somewhere you didn't correct everything back here. You have not repented of something. Your heart's gotten hardened. So when you understand repentance, unlike locks the door to your prayer life. Once you have freed yourself from that, you have no more guilt. You have no more condemnation. You can come boldly to the throne of grace just like you had never sinned. That's called justification. Just as if you have never sinned. But if you if you let something go on finished you have not corrected the sin you did it may be so ever so little now let me show you what this is if a man and a woman that's married together husband and wife begin to get into a disagreement Satan is doing this to bring a division now, she says something she shouldn't have said, and he says something she shouldn't have said. He shouldn't have said. Now, uh, they don't do anything about it. They just figure it's just a squabble, and that's it. But it'll get worse and worse and worse. What they didn't do is correct it right away. Either one party or the other can correct that thing. You see, when there's a relationship severed, one party can take care of it. Now, that don't mean that you're always going to have good things happen to you. But at least on your part, God can work with the partner. He can work with your wife or your husband. But if you don't see anything wrong with it and you justify yourself by, well, everybody has their ups and downs. Everybody has their... They do. Where does the Bible say everybody has their ups and downs? Where does the Bible say that that uh, we, we are justified by doing wrong. It says all have sinned and come short of glory. That's past tense. All have. But that's past tense. We have all sinned and come short of glory of God. But thanks be to God for Calvary. Repentance is not a mere, I shouldn't have done this. If you take the problem that the Lord has convicted on you, it seems so little, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, this no, we're used to sin. You take that thing and you set it before you. Okay, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Do you know the Lord will give you repentance? Now watch this. In meekness, instructing those that, uh, 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 in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if peradventure the Lord will give them repentance through the knowledge and the truth. The truth is, I've sinned. God will give you repentance, and brother, tears will come, and sisters, tears will come. It's not a mere apology anymore. I've grieved my father. My heavenly Father's grieved. I've broken one or more of the laws of God. That's why America is so lawless. You repent of that thing. I remember there was a time that I wasn't that kind to my wife. Thank God that's been years ago now. And I told my, the Lord one time, I said, Lord, I've apologized to my wife. I've tried to change and everything, but I just feel so bad about that thing. And he said, 
You can't keep repenting and repenting and repenting and repenting over it. Because once repentance takes place, it's gone. It's past tense. So he said, what you do, you keep bringing it back up again. You can't bring up what you repented of. You've got to get rid of that thing. We start a new ground. And repentance will open the door to prayer. And I, I tell you something, for years my wife and I have lived in, in wonderful peace. Wonderful peace. Because I learned that whatever I did wrong to her before is past tense. What I can do and what you can do and all of us can do in our life is, is start looking for the future. The future is the only place we go. Remember the word reward. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but anyway, the Bible speaks about fasting and then talks about uh, the Lord will be your reward. Right. He'll take care of that stuff back there. You move on. There'll be friends try to bring up the past back there. You keep moving on. You don't listen to them. If it's taken care of, it's over. It's it's free. Paul, uh, after he had broken free from his past, <clears throat> he recognized he didn't have a past. I'm looking forward. I go forward. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. And I'm looking back. Well, you say, well, I'm still in problem. I still have problem. You see, if you still have problems, you probably do not have the fruit of repentance. The, the fruit of repentance is godly sorrow for sin. It is, it is breaking the alliance. It is loosing you from the bondage of satanic forces that had you bound. You are now free because Jesus said he come to set us free. If the Son has made you free, you're free indeed. But if you hadn't truly repented of that, if you put an excuse in there, well, Lord, uh, you know, the really the reason I did this was because, no, you might as well forget it. Right there, you just cut everything off from heaven. There's nothing there. That's the reason the Pharisees and the Sadducees come down to get repentance. They, Paul said, "You, I mean, uh, John said, I don't see any fruit in you fellas. Where's your fruit? You bunch of snakes. Well, that certainly wouldn't go across very good today. I mean, come on, be nice. That's the trouble. We haven't dealt with sin the way sin needs to be dealt with. Flat down, tell it what it is. See, sin has become a part of life. Your thought life, you... It, it go give you problems. You keep thinking and thinking and thinking, meditating upon, pondering. A hankering after Egypt. A real, a real picture of lack of repentance is when, when uh, <clears throat> the Israelites came out of Egypt. And you've heard many people say that the Israelites came out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't come out of the Israelites. You've heard that story many times, and that's true. They get down there and they got the thing, watermelons, uh, onions, garlic, uh, yeah, oh my. Back there where the milk and honey flew and we worked hard and it was cruelly handled, but they had a hankering for that. If they'd have cut it off, if they'd have cut Egypt henceforth off forever, once that water closed on those Israelites and the enemy is floating around uh, dying, that's it for Egypt. No more going back to Egypt. We're heading for the wilderness. The God who brought us through the sea is going to help us, but they didn't repent of something. There's no repentance, so therefore they're hankering after the things they used to have, and they can't understand why the Lord don't come on the scene. Folks, if you have a problem in your life and you've broken through from your sin life and you're still having struggle, find out what it is. That is where prayer will unlock that key and show you what is wrong if you really mean it. Now, if you don't mean it, <clears throat> it's not going to help at all. It's not going to help at all. But that little by little hardness of the heart, well, that wasn't too bad. Well, harden your heart. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, it's... Uh, 
I just, I, I've got so vexed because I just went to Walmart here some time ago and I told the lady, you gave me too much money back. Oh, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I, I tried to explain to her she was older. I said, ma'am, I gave you this amount of money. You gave me you need that. She said, no, I do it right. I know what I'm doing. So I said, all right, Lord, I'm not responsible for this. I went out to put my groceries in the car, and I'm not in very good shape as it is because I didn't have anybody with me, and I get out there, and I saw that something that I'd put in the cart wasn't taken out, and it wasn't paid for. And I came through, and it isn't paid for. And I got frustrated. I said, now, Lord, I got to go back in and get that thing taken care of. And I'm too tired, and I can't do it now. So I said, I'll take it home and go back later. And, and what I began to do was thinking. If I'd have thought, well, you know, after all, I came through it, it's not a big deal. No, no. You let that go, that little thing. You let it go, and you'll become harder and harder and harder. Folks, you got to take care of the little things. They have to be, it's, it, there may be some things that's easier to get rid of. I don't mean you have to cry over everything. But there is some time in your life when you are bound up, and you better find out what you're bound up for. Uh, I just was saying something to somebody here this evening. I met a, a fellow one time, and I said, good evening. He said, what's good about the evening? Uh, just as hateful as he could speak. And I said, what's the problem? Well, I ain't had no good days in years. Ain't no such thing as good days. Everything gone backward, everything gone wrong. You know what? This gave me an opportunity. Let's go back and check things out. Folks, if you've got a problem like this, go back and find out where the roots is at. See, when Jesus said, now that, or John said, now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, he means you're going to cut off that thing forever that's bothering you. It's past tense. It's over. That old tree is dead. It'll never bring forth fruit again. When Jesus cursed that fig tree, it never brought forth fruit again. Never, ever did it bring forth fruit again. Because it was not what he was looking for. He's looking for fruit you can eat, not leaves. That's an illustration that if you don't kill that thing at the root, it'll keep tormenting you and coming back on you and coming back on you. You're, so you, when you begin to cry out, Lord, I don't know what's wrong, but I'm just feeling terrible today about something. My, my heart seems to be bothering me about something, and I don't know of any sin I've done, but uh, my heart is troubled. And if he could do it, he'd say to you, yeah, there's 13 things you've been doing out there and covering them up, just covering them, covering them up, covering them. The reason you can't break that habit you got is because you are still something you didn't correct back there. So I have no hope for you. I can't help you. Back yonder, somewhere, you didn't take care of something. It may be on paid bills. It may be something you didn't repent of. And incidentally, repentance calls sometimes for reconciliation, it calls for sometimes for restitution. I didn't pay that fella. I need to go back and pay him. And you see, heaven is locked up a lot of times. Heaven's locked. It's completely locked. It's because we haven't corrected it. You haven't cut it off at the roots. And the way you cut it off the roots, the Bible talks about uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. 
it says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You're not going to get the Holy Ghost, the right Holy Ghost. You might get a fictitious Holy Ghost, but you're not going to get the real thing until you have truly repented. You saw sin as exceeding sinful. You saw when, when your heart was crying out, something was wrong, the Lord picked on it. He said, this is what your trouble is, right? Oh, I don't pay no attention. Now, that can't be. Yeah, your heart now becomes real hard. Oh, that, uh, that doesn't make any difference. That doesn't matter. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not a preacher. That he, he and another fellow had a fallout. And he gossiped about him in tail bar and carried on. And uh, they had a real struggle. I mean, a mighty struggle. And he said, <clears throat> that preacher moved off. He said, one day I decided to get down on my face and repent of my sins. I mean, I'm going to get rid of everything that's bothering me. I'm going to get rid of it. And he said, every time I started to pray, this man's name came up. I said, well, Lord, it wasn't my fault. I mean, he's the one that's blamed. So he said, all of a sudden, my prayer life is gone. I can't preach half. I can't do nothing. He said, all right. Lord, if you'll show me where that fellow's at, I'm going to go correct this thing. He couldn't find him. He got in a car, and he drove to this state, and drove into a town, and he said, does anybody here know a fellow by the name of so-and-so? No. And he began to cry out to God, Lord, I've got to find this man. I've got to find him. See, repentance costs you. It can cost you. It can cost. He is determined, I'm going to find that man. So one time, he kept crying out to the Lord, Lord, if you'll show me where this man's at, I'll repent. I'll tell him I'm sorry. It doesn't make any difference who's blame. I'm going to take care of my end of the deal because I can't keep going like this. And weeks went past, and he was preaching at a church one day, and he can't half preach because he's under condemnation. And he said, Lord, i got to find that man. And he said, I stepped up on the pulpit, and that fellow was sitting in the audience. He said, I'm going to tell you something. I could preach with absolute authority. I could preach now without any problem. I've got this man in this circle. I'm going to get him before he gets out that door. When he come to the place of giving an invitation for prayer, this fellow gets out of his seat and comes up. He said, Pastor, I've been tormented day and night. I had to find you. we got to get some things straight now. He said, right there in front of everybody, we hugged each other and confessed our sins and tears and agony and free at last free at last see if you blame the other fellow it doesn't matter who's to blame it doesn't make any difference these excuses never go you'll never be free by blaming somebody else take your responsibility take your duty I, I happened to know this man and I was so thrilled I was thrilled with this story. I was just really thrilled with it. But this man didn't just do a halfway job. Another preacher that I know, and you all know, and I'm not going to tell you who he is, but all of you in here know him. Well, maybe John doesn't back yonder, but most of y'all know him anyway. Uh, he had done some things in his useful days it wasn't right. And one of them was he cheating people and doing all kind of things. And the Lord got on his case, and he told me this story himself. He said, the Lord got on my case. And he said, you need to repent. You need to get this thing out of the way. 
And he said, so I went back to a McDonald's, one of the fast food places, I believe it was McDonald's, went back to McDonald's and said, uh, when I was such and such age, I, uh, I stole some money off of y'all. And I need to make it right. Uh, who's the uh, manager around here? The manager said, oh, my goodness, that thing's changed hands. I don't know how many times since that. Well, he said, it doesn't make any difference. How can you help me trace it back to the original owner? He said, well, I'll see what I can do. He said, listen, this is really serious. The fellow said, you mean to tell me that that you came the whole way here to correct this thing? He said, I had to. The Lord made me. I can't have freedom anymore. He said, well, maybe, maybe you better talk to me. Maybe there's some things in my life that I need to get straightened out. And you know... Because he saw the sincerity of this, he began to call people. Do you know who owned this place? He said, yeah, but he moved out. He's at another place. And he said, is there any way anybody can find this man? I got to talk to him. Well, after several weeks of uh, trying to find him, see what I'm saying? This is real repentance, folks. This is the real stuff. This is good stuff. He said, I finally found a man and went down there. And I told him, look, when you had that McDonald's up to that place, I stole some money off you. The guy said, oh, my goodness. You came down here to tell me that. He said, I thought you had something to talk to me about. He said, I do. I do have something to talk to you about. I was wrong. And I'm going to pay you back. He said, well, I don't know how much it was. Forget it. He said, I can't forget it. I don't have anything to forget. I can't forget it. I'm correcting it. So they made an agreement. And he said, what happened next was, as soon as I handed him the money, heaven came on the scene. And this fellow said, if this is Christianity, I better get saved. Yeah. The reason a lot of soul winners never get anywhere, they've never corrected their life. They've never made the necessary changes in their own life. See, they might have been baptized, but what is that? See, the Bible says, like figure whereas even baptism uh, doth uh, also now save us by the putting away the filth of the flesh, whether the answer of a good conscience towards God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, baptism is saying to the people, I've corrected. I have repented. I've turned around. I've changed. I'm no longer what I used to be. I've taken care of my sins. See, what happens, you sin, and, well, I mean, you're guilty, so you, the last thing you want to do is pray. And then you get this invitation. But look, uh, you already blow it. You blew it anyway, so you might as well go and blow it some more. And you might as well blow it some more. And you might as well blow it some more. And you get harder and harder and harder and harder and further and further and further from God. Yeah. A fella in Pennsylvania. I didn't know his uh, him personally, but he got with the wrong crowd, <clears throat> and he started downhill. And he kept getting downhill further and further and further and further away from God. A fellow had a, back in those days, they filled your car up. It wasn't self-service, you filled your car up. And he said to him, he said, young man, you know you were brought up different than this. This man wasn't even a Christian. He said, you know better than that. Running these women and girls and doing the things you're doing. And 
We're going to meet your maker someday. He said, oh, <laughs> I'm a young man. And somebody come up past there about the same time and said, where are you guys going? One fellow hollered out the wood and said, we're going three miles down the road to hell. Where are you going? You know what? A little bit later, ambulance is gone. He closed that store up and got in his car and measured it. Three miles down the road, those boys was killed. That's what happens when you don't repent. See, repentance is not just, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I tell you, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit doing this. I'm going to quit this. I mean, this is it. Now, I made up my mind. I'm going to quit this habit. I'm going to quit it. No, you're not. You haven't seen it exceeding the sense you're still loving it. You still want it. You still want to hang around with the same crowd that tore you down the first time. You still want to hang around with that same crowd and you're going to end up in the same place they ended up at. Oh, God loves you. Yeah, you'll wait and see whether God loves you. There's multitudes of people will be in eternity lost. And God loved them. Every one of them. Love is not the plan of salvation. Salvation came by love, but that's not what saves you. Um, the Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't think that fruit was that important. But John called them snakes. I'm going to say something now that's about as mean as you can talk about, I guess. But I wonder if the Lord would walk into any of our churches. <coughs> what he would say to some of our people, what would he say? What do you say? You're a snake. What are you doing here? Snakes don't intermingle with righteous people. Tears in the church because they've never repented. He said to go take the tares out first and burn them. They've never repented. Repentance simply means cutting off, never to do it again. It's finished, turning completely around, starting the other direction. <clears throat> you can have people that cry and say great things about that, you know, they once was lost and now I'm found and so forth. But if you're around them very long, some of them, you start hearing them say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You start hearing them say things that indicates they start justifying themselves for what they used to be. Start justifying yourself for what you used to be. Yeah, I used to do that, and I used to do this. And you can tell by the tone of voice, they're pretty glad for it. They want to tell you about what they used to do. Because this gives them a uh, good testimony and probably get a good offering at it. When it's cut off, cut it off. Get it going. <clears throat> I've never met this preacher, but he's a precious old soul. He's deceased now. But one time somebody wanted to bring an electric chair to his church. And... <clears throat> He was supposed to end up on this electric chair and got out of it somehow. He wanted to take and bring his electric chair to church and show the people uh, how wicked he used to be. And so he come to this fella, and he said, I wrote him back, because he wrote to me, I wrote him back and said, Sir, get rid of that electric chair. Get out there and show people how to get out of sin. You don't have to relive your life. Go out and show them how to get free. So that's the last I heard out of him. Because you see, he's getting money by this electric chair. That's the same thing with hell's angels. That get, you know, uh, past hell's angel. You know, yeah, yeah. He wants you to know he's a hell's angel, and you can get a lot of crowd of people in there. Boy, this fellow used to be a hell's angel. I'm going to go down and listen to him, her, or wherever it may be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next hell's angel wanted to come to our church one time. And I said, no, nope, we don't allow such thing. We don't, we're, we're not ex-hell's angels. We completely annihilated from them. 
I don't want to hear your confession about you serving it. I don't care what you did. I'm not interested in your devilish stuff that you did. Come on, let's get, get right with it. Listen, folks. Confession is a loosing agent. Confession is more than acknowledging one's transgression, but it is a bold confession of wrongdoing. All right, I was wrong here. When that heart cry turns into a prayer of agony, I am in trouble with God. But most people are going to turn right around God and do the same thing they did before. I'm in trouble with God. Yeah, but I got my buddies. They, I might hurt them. And furthermore, I need to stay with my old buddies so I get them saved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many of them old buddies got saved down the way? Ask some of our people. One of our people got in that mess. Go to stay with them to get them saved. Have to. He's no longer around. He's out there in the world crying out. Don't know what to do. He's destroying his own life. He'll acknowledge that he don't know what to do. He's out of it. Go back to your old buddies. They're the ones who got you in trouble in the first place. Get away from them. Flee from them. The Bible says flee from fornication. You can't hang around people that's been messing you up. When David repented of his transgression, it wasn't a mere confession of transgression. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I know that wasn't right. I just know it wasn't right. You know what his cry was? He began to get in earnest. Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He's weeping. He's crying. He's agonizing. I've, this is the only way David could come back on the throne. You can say all you want to say. God saw this man. He knew how to repent. That's what it's all about. Repentance. Repentance opens the door to prayer. When you're free, you can just pray just in freedom. I mean, just pray. I mean, just pray. It's just so free. I mean, no guilt and no condemnation, no nothing. Well, aren't you the one that, that robbed that bank? No, that fellow died. I just carry his name, but he died years ago. That's what the Bible said, dead to the sins. You know, David's confession in Psalms 51 is really something. He cried out and said, against thee and thee only have I done this sin. Most people don't like that because it's too, per too personal. You've got to get into this thing. David cried out with tears and agony. And he said, a contrite, uh, a broken and a contrite heart thou will not despise. He knew it's going to take that brokenness. He knew it's going to take that weeping. You know, God is tired of these so-called Christians that have no tears. Just go do the bad things and, and just apologize for them. And, yeah, well... We have to have a, rec a, you know, somebody counseling for the next 20 weeks because, you know, I tell you what, you cut sin off once and for all, and you don't need no counseling. You get rid of that sin, you don't need no counseling ever again. Cut it off. Cut it off. I mean, this is it. Oh, a lot of people do that. I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to have anything to do with you anymore. Just go. i just tell you right now, I'm not having any more to do with you. Until next time. Yeah. The next time, you're right back where you started from. And the next time. And the next time. And the next time. Satan knows every time you say you're going to quit and you do it again, he knows that he can keep you going. He's got you. It takes a day when you say enough's enough. A man, you can pray through then. 
If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's that confession with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus has delivered me. I'm set free. I'm delivered. Oh, you are. What's your thoughts like in the daytime? What are you thinking about? About your past? You know, folks, you know, you know why the Bible says flee fornication? You know why? If you don't flee it, if you don't run away from it, if you don't get completely away from the person you have had an affair with, if you don't get completely away from them, Satan will see to it you do that same act again and again and again and again. I don't care if you move a thousand miles away. You get back there, I'll pester you, I'm going to tell you, Satan will see to it you get tripped. You know what Jesus said to the Pharisees when he saw them? Same crowd of people who probably got baptized down there or was trying to be. Jesus looked at those Pharisees and he said, You will die in your sins. They've never repented. It's, they've got their religious system. I tell you, folks, when this thing is over, your slate is clean. Now, I mean, you can kneel down and pray. And you can pray through. Praying through requires diligence, perseverance, and restoration. Praying until you break through is not a simple thing. David's heart cry was, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalms 51, 11. You know what? That's a complete different story to most people's God in repentance. He realized he's in trouble. That's it. No. Our Heavenly Father does not accept excuses or apologies. He accepts a bold, he expects a bold confession. I have, we have sinned. David said, I've sinned. He didn't say, we have sinned. He said, I did. I sinned. I tell you, folks, I can look to your eyeball to eyeball tonight and tell you that my sins are gone. Are you beyond sinning? Oh, I didn't say that. I said my sins are gone. I don't want them. I don't need them. They went nailed to the cross of Calvary. But there was a time that I'd say, yeah, Lord, don't cast me away from your presence either. Psalms 91 and 51 is the place to go when you've sinned. Go there and read it over and over again and pray it and pray it. And if you don't shed any tears, you're not repenting anyway. You're not sorry. And if you've got a few little goosebumps, that's not going to make it. It's agonizing tears. Folks, I'll tell you what. When my life turned around from all the things that I used to do, when it turned around, I agonized. I wept. I agonized. I repented. I pled with the Lord. Restore me once again. That's been many years ago, but it changed. I don't have a past. You can't bring up a past that you don't have. Jesus took care of the past and gave me a future. And I'll tell you what, folks. Prayer unlocks. That door now you can pray through. Okay, now, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know what Paul did when he fell off of that uh, uh, horse down there? He said, what would you have me do, Lord? What do you have me to do? Repentance can be a battle. It can be a real battle. I mean, I'm talking about a real serious battle. The sacrifice of God, our broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart, O oh Lord, that will not despise. What, what the church needs today, folks, is tears. This troubles me day and night. It really does. We've gotten so used to sin that it's just normal business. There's people committing adultery and they don't even know it all the time going into these doctor's offices and stuff, committing adultery. They don't 
don't care. It doesn't make any difference to them. We've gotten used to sin. He'll be covered with his sins are not crushed, but whosoever confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. He to cover if you sin. Oh, yeah, well, I'll tell you what. I shouldn't have done that. I know I shouldn't. I'll tell you what. I'm making this real, su not a suggestion to you. I'm telling you, if you want to get free, you're going to have to get away from those people that caused you to fall in the first place. You're going to have to. No, it stands much about it. It's going to take tears, too. There's no such thing as uh, as coming against God and breaking all the laws and commandments of God and, and just saying, well, it's okay. I mean, everything's okay now. If there wasn't tears in it, it isn't. Once that thing's cut off, you'll know it. I'm telling you, you will know it. Free. I don't have any guilt. I don't I need any. And I tell you what, I, if I have to keep right with God.